Hello and welcome to section two of this three-part, I think three-part lecture on the language of Old English. In the second part, we're going to talk about syntax and morphology. In other words, grammar. Who doesn't love grammar? No one. Um, pictured here is the a, a medical book that was also a magic book. It has charms um, because, you know, early medieval medicine included not just sort of like, you know, recipes for poultices and, and uh, laxatives, but also sort of charms to keep elves from making you sick and whatnot. Um, so this is called Bald's Leech Book, and it's one of the most famous books of early medieval medicine. Um, this is the shelf mark of it, and there's a link here that you can go to to find out more about this and similar manuscripts. Um, but I, I, I include it here because um, there was considered to be a connection between magic and grammar in the Middle Ages. The word grimoire, in fact, which is a word meaning spell book, is, comes from an old French word related to the word grammar. And in a population where 90% of the people couldn't read, um, writing itself seemed to have some kind of magical power. And this, this survives in our association of the word spelling with the word spell, as in a magic spell. So, yeah, don't trust people who can read and write. They might be magicians, is, is what is the takeaway here. I'm just kidding. Let's talk about grammar. The first thing we're going to talk about, because it's the thing that's the most distinct from modern English, is the Old English noun phrase. A noun, of course, is a person, place, or thing, or a concept, and it, you know, um, it uh, is points to things in the world. It comes from an old uh, French word meaning name, actually. So a noun is is a name, and um, in the modern in, in modern English, nouns do not have cases. In Old English, they did have cases, um, and that means different endings of the word depending on what they were, the role the noun is playing in the sentence. So, for example, in in the modern the modern English pronouns have cases. You can't say I see he. That's wrong. You say I see him. You don't say me see him. So we use different pronouns depending on their whether they're the subject the direct object or the indirect object. Imagine if we had to do that with all nouns, not just pronouns. Um, this is the case in Latin and Russian and Sanskrit and Romanian and many, many world languages, especially Indo-European languages. German, in fact, still has the same four cases that Old English has, which is nominative, accusative, dative, and genitive. And the nominative is basically the case that's used for the subject and the subject pre predicate. And uh, subject pre predicate is when I say, like, I am a teacher. That's basically teacher is just predicating something, saying something about the subject. So uh, I, teacher, both nominative in an inflected case language like Old English. So when we say the good stone rolls downhill, the good stone is in the nominative case. Accusative is the direct object case, and it's when the, ver the noun is sort of being directly acted on. So I see, I kick, I throw, I sew, I massage, I, uh, I, I drop, all of these, whatever you're doing these things to, take the accusative case. So I see the good stones, accusative. A dative case is a funnier one because it combines a, a few things in, mo in Old English that are kind of separated in Modern English. One is the indirect object. Um, I give the, a nice shine to the good stone, right? Then that takes the dative case, and it comes from a Latin word, dare, to give. So you think about giving something to something else, and that sort of encapsulates the idea of the indirect object. It also is used in Old English um, as the object of a great many prepositions. So if you say by something, for something, with something, to something, that something is often going to be in the dative case. And finally, we have the genitive case, which actually, um, I lie when I say we don't have inflections in modern English nouns. We do. We have one. This is a boat. This is the sail of the boat. 
No, you could also say this is the boat's sail. And because we put that little apostrophe in boats, we don't necessarily think of that as we think of it as being something like tacked on, but it's actually part of the word. It is the survival of the genitive case of Old English. So the genitive is used for the possessive, but it can also be used um, in many cases where we would have to use the uh, the expression of in modern English. So we wouldn't say this is a sword. We would say this is a sword of iron, right? We wouldn't say this is iron's sword. That that wouldn't make sense. But in Old English, you can say iron's sword because that genitive case includes the possessive, but it also includes the idea of of being made of something or or being the property of something. And it also has the concept of we have a, a object genitive like love of a mother. Um, can be both, well, that can be confusing uh, in modern English and in old English. In any case, these are the four cases. And they're go and what it means is that the old English form of the good stone is going to have a different case. It's going to look differently. And now here's the other kicker. Articles, the, it has different cases in old English too. And you can see the different cases and numbers um, a little more detail than you need to go into here, but uh, the, for the noun and also adjectives have cases too. And the noun has to agree with the adjective in case, gender, masculine or fe feminine, and number, singular or plural, and in earlier forms of Old English actually also dual. So let's just illustrate this. The good stone rolls downhill, se good stan. This is how you say the good stone in Old English, but only when it's the subject or the subject predicate. I see the good stone, you would have to say, ich sea the godna stan. So we could see that the accusative and, sub and, the, and the nominative are the same in the noun, but in the adjective, they're different. And in some kinds of nouns, they're different. And, and you know, it, it, it's complicated. And if you take 561, sorry, 591 with me, you'll learn it in greater detail. I'm just giving you an idea of how the language works here. The is said differently depending on whether it's a subject or an object. Se god stan, ich sea the godna stan. I sit near the good stone. Well, this is a prepositional phrase that will take the dative. Ich seta neach tham godem stanem. And you, when you see that um ending, that's always usually a dative ending in Old English. Tham godem stanam. So three forms of the, of the good stone. Se god stan, tha godna stan, tham godem stanam. And then we're going to use the genitive or the, uh, I, a piece of the good stone. Chip. That's the Old English word chip from which we get chip off the old block. Chip thas godis stanis. So these are four different ways of saying the good stone and different there are different classes of nouns that will have different kinds of inflectional endings there are different classes of adjectives um, how did people learn this well they, well they the human brain has an amazing ability to acquire language between um, uh, two and five years old and no matter how complicated the inflectional system of your language you will acquire it and and it, you your your brain will make these categories and it will come as naturally to you if you're an old english speaker in 800 to say each say the good stan instead of each say a say good stan as it comes naturally for us to say i like her instead of i like she now one of the implications of this of course uh if, sorry about the glare on the light, I'm recording at home. One of the implications of this is that the word order in Old English is a little freer. You can move things around more and you can say, you know, um, you know, I, the, I, the good stone I see, you know, and, and so enough about nouns, so let's talk about pronouns. Um, pronouns, of course, stand are, are in the modern English. It's, you know, I, me, she, he, it. They stand in for nouns. They take the place of nouns. They are the most... Um, Com one of the most commonly used class of, of, of words, um, each pronoun is used much more than almost any other word because they take the place of other words so frequently. Um, and, you know, in, in modern English, the singular subject is I, right? And in Old English, it's each. And if anybody who, who studied any German 
will clearly recognize the the Germanic connection there. You know, ich in, in German is ich in Old English. And it's common, by the way, for the ch sound in German to be a ch sound in, in, in Old English and its descendants. Um, the plural is we, right? Not we, but we. There's the IPA for you in this column. And in Old English, we also have, um, especially in earlier texts, a dual number. So we too is wit. Um, and then the second person, which in English in English is, um, what's the su what's the subject in in you like cheese, you. What about cheese likes you, you. What about the what about the plural? Well, it's still you. Although in some dialects, of course, we have y'all or, if you're around Pittsburgh, yins or some of my family in Long Island might say use which just sounds terrible to me, but, but that, that's, there, there you go. Um, but in Old English, we had the singular was thou, right? And this is where that, your Shakespearean thou comes from. And this was the singular, and the plural was ye. Remember that the G before a high vowel or a front vowel is a ye sound, not a g sound. And then the dual is yit, is, is you two, yit. <laughs> Crazy, huh? So, thou, ye. Um, what about he, she, it? Well, close, hey is he, hit, heyo is feminine. Now that's weird. Much later we'll get seo uh, for she, uh, but that, that I think is from um, not West Saxon. That comes from another variety of Old English um, uh, that, that uh, ended up taking over. I think it's from the North, not 100% sure, but I think, yeah. Um, and then the plural is he, now, what about the, they, as was, we'll learn in the next video, they, them, and their, was actually borrowed into Old English, late in the Old English period, from Old Norse. And it was only by the late Middle English period that they, them, their completely supplanted uh, he, or some var variant, or he, in, in as um, the, the plural of, the, of he, of, of, or she, it's the they, it was, it was he, and we see that even as late as Chaucer, in, a lot of Chaucer, uh, in Chaucer's London dialect of Middle English. Um, in the north in Chaucer's time, they were saying they already, and they gradually moved down. So this is our nominative pronoun system, right? Our subject pronouns. And then our accusative pronouns will look familiar. Mek or may is accusative, you know, she sees me. Um, Usik, usich is is us, right? Um, the the object case, and then the unkit, that dual, and then the singular, thick or the, is so instead of thou, it's the, right? So you can I hate when I'm listening to some bad, uh, like fake medieval thing, and people use thou and the wrong. The is the accusative. It's the su it's the object. Thou or thou is the subject. So I like thee, thou like me. Um, we're a happy family. Eoch is the plural accusative, you, itch, um, and then inch it. And then masculine accusative, hinna is him, hit is hit, that h will drop out later. And the feminine is hie. Wait a second, that's the same as the plural uh, common gender. Uh, well, Yes, it is, and that's a little confusing, although if, when we get to verbs, we'll realize that the verb has to agree, too, and that'll indicate, but not always. So this is one of the reasons why they might have taken over to he is to get rid of that ambiguity. And then there's the dative cases for all these things, and these actually formed the basis of our modern um, object cases. It, was, it comes from the dative, not the accusative. Uh, and then the genitive, mine. Mine, ura, your. Right? Thin, thine, eor, your, his, hera, heora. And so there is heora, but her is hera. And we can see already that her as the object and her as the possessive have already merged in the Old English period. All right, so, so I'm just taking you through that, a quick tour on that. You can look through it yourself. What about the Old English verb? Well, the Old English verb is tricky. Not as tricky as the Latin verb, um, but the thing is that we have a distinction between strong verbs and weak verbs. Um, and a strong verb is a verb that changes vowel in the stem. We still have strong verbs, I drink, I drank, I drunk, 
I swim, I swam, I swum. I have swum, I have swam. Um, and the strong uh, think, thank, thunk, nope, that, that one isn't think, thought, but that is still a strong verb, right? Um, and, there, and as we can see, not all stem changes in the, are the same. In Old English, there were actually seven classes of stem changes. If you take Old English, you'll memorize these to help you um, predict how to make the past tense of the, and the, the partic past participle of the verb. So, biton, uh, bat, biton, bitin is to, to command or to order. Fleon, to fly. Flea, flugon, flogon, spring on, sprang, sprung. See, that looks pretty similar to modern English, doesn't it? Kuman, kam, kamon, yef, yef, yefun, that's to give. Takan, tok, tokon, taken, this is to touch. Hailed on, hailed, hailed on, hailed on is to hold. And see, all these are strong verbs. The thing about strong verbs um, is that it's not um, a, what, what linguists call a productive morpheme. This is to say, we're not making new ones. When we coin a new verb, you know, to say, say I'm going to text someone, right, which is a back formation from the noun text, um, we, don't, we don't say, what's the pa past tense of text? Well, how about taxed? I taxed him yesterday. No, we say I texted, right? Or, or I, I, I um, download is not like a doom mood. You don't, you don't change the stem. Uh, you, you add an uh, ede at the ending, just like they did in Old English. And these were weak verbs. And this is a, a common feature of Germanic languages. It was Jacob Grimm, Jacob Grimm, I should say, the Germanic philologist who coined the, the, these terms for the distinction between strong and weak. Why, why he used those particular terms to distinguish them, I don't know, except maybe it's like, they're, oh, these are the job, more German verbs that are stronger, I don't know. Forms, but the forms pass the tense by adding ede, oda, or de, and that's some kind of dental to the, to the present stem to form the past tense. And it also, is in a similar way, forms the past participle, right? Um, the participle is the thing that we make compound pasts out of, and it's also a, um, it can be used as an adjective. So like, for example, uh, drown. Sorry for the morbid example, it's the first one that came to mind. Drown, I drown, you drowned, I have drowned, right? He is drowned, there is a drowned rat. These are the, this, this, we can see the past and this, the participle. We also have an infinitive ending of a, of a n usually in um, Old English verb, which we've lost that. Now we make our, our infinitives by adding the word to. So the present of, of bode, to, which is to, to live somewhere, to, to dwell, bodoth, past tense, bododa, past participle, bodod. Um, and other verbal and nouns include the ende, ande ending for the gerund. The gerund is a verbal noun that it's, it's how we call the act of doing something. So, you know, walking, sleeping, but not when we use it as an adjective, it's a participle. So it's like the walking horse or the sleeping person, that's the present participle. But when we say, I like walking or have you done any sleeping? That is then a noun, and that's a gerund. But and in Old English, we would say sleependa or wakanda rather than wakanda forever, um, rather than ing, right? So this is a feature of old, and that that gerund ending survives in Middle English too. And we have the salsa this again, this inflected infinitive, tobodiana. That's probably more detail than you need for now, but I just want to give you a sense of the system of the English verb. Um, I think this is an, enough to just sort of give you an overview of some of the complications that existed in the Old English um, grammar that uh, have changed into different kinds of complications in modern English uh, through the process of inflection loss that has gone on over the years. This is the end of this second lecture on Old English language uh, that, that treats morphology and syntax. Next, we will look at lexicon how Old English forms words, uh, how it borrowed words, and, and yeah, uh, so follow along with that one. Bye.
and, and it preserves the function in this sentence by the case ending. Uh, and, and poets make use of this and makes poetry sometimes especially difficult to read because they scramble up the word order to fit their alliterative 